Murat Yilik, President of the P Global and an international expert on investment promotion, will be moderating this session. Thank you very much. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, Salam Aleikum uh, and welcome to the last session of today. I know it has been a very tiring day for all of us, including you, the, the listeners as well as uh, the speakers. Uh, but let's just um, uh, complete this last session, which will be basically uh, based on an idea by the Islamic Development Bank. The idea is called the reverse linkages. Reverse linkage means, this is again an idea, a strategic idea that the IDB uses, is how to make the member countries of IDB benefit from each other's experience. So today in this last session, I have three distinguished speakers who are going to provide their experiences and their opinion about uh, how Egypt could further strengthen its uh, position as a destination of investments. I have uh, Mr. Mustafa Rumeli, he is vice, who is vice president of Turkish Investment Promotion Agency uh, with me. And I have uh, Mr. Zulkifli Ismail from MIDA, which is Malaysian Investment Promotion Agency. And then lastly, I have Dr. Ahmed Isam El Bakri, who is from uh, Islamic Corporation for the Development of the Private Sector, which is the private sector arm of the Islamic Development Bank. Now, we will start with Mustafa Rumeli, who again is the Vice President of Turkish Investment Promotion Agency, and he has been also involved in the Turkish, uh, in the, let's say, design of Turkish investment promotion policies. And uh, the timing will be uh, a maximum of 15 minutes for each speaker, where uh, I think the best is for the speaker to, uh, let's say, showcase the key experiences, key lessons that, uh, for example, Turkey or Malaysia or internationally, Dr. Ahmed, uh, that these institutions has drawn based on the previous experience. Okay, Mustafa Bey. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> first of all, I would like to thank our Egyptian friends for organizing such an important event. And I also would like to thank our esteemed uh, colleagues from the Islamic Development Bank Group for inviting uh, Ispat uh, to this panel. My name is Mustafa Rumeli and I represent ISPAT. ISPAT, that is the official IPA of Turkey. <laughs> Sorry that I have a sore throat, but I have distributed out the handouts, uh, conference notes of my presentation, which you can follow. <clears throat> I have divided my presentation into three parts today. In the first part, I would like to look at the investor mindset, what the investors look in a country as far as the Turkish experience is concerned. In the second part, I will look at how Turkey has achieved economic success through political stability. I will analyze that. And in the third part, I will look at uh, our agency, ISPAT, and what we do for investors. <coughs> we, really need to we really need to answer this question, what do investors look for in a foreign country? And I can only speak for myself as for uh, the Turkish case. As far as uh, the Turkish experience is concerned, the investors look, first of all, for a country that is stable. And stability actually comes from political stability. When, when, when you have political stability, economic success usually follows if you have prudent policies. And the uh, investors look whether <coughs> the industry that they operate, their industries, their sectors, are supported by the government's policies and whether there is a suitable investment environment and whether there are sufficient uh, state aids and incentives. And thirdly, they, they want an authority, they want an agency that they can talk to, convey their requests, ask for assistance. <clears throat> and uh, taking these uh, analysis into consideration, we have adopted the marketing uh, strategy and the marketing discipline tells us that we have to understand, anticipate, and satisfy the needs of the customers, in which case 
uh, this time it is the investors. And when we conduct uh, surveys uh, with the existing investors and potential investors, our analysis shows that it is right. The investors most of the time look firstly for a country that is politically stable, having the right economic uh, policies. <coughs> As stated, the importance of FDI attraction for countries is crucial. We all agree on that. Naturally, organizations structured to accomplish this task do get important as well. Here you can see a survey conducted by the World Bank, which says that usually the investors, before investing in a country, take into account promotional activities, and majority of them, they try to work with uh, IPAs. <clears throat> and now I would like to give you how Turkey has transformed itself <clears throat> from a weak economy to a strong economy. The importance of political stability will be evident here because before 10 years ago when AK party government was not in rule, we had coalition governments and we had elections every year. We had coalitions, we had economic crisis. And at that time, he only used to attract one billion USD dollar of FDI every year. But now, that that has increased to around 10 to 15 thousand. And to, in 2007, we have attracted <coughs> approximately 22 billion USD. And Istanbul Stock Exchange, the index was around 10 thousand, and now we have seen 90 thousand. So again you can see how important political stability is because the government is in the office for the last three times and at each election the government is getting higher votes to previous elections. And as I said, Turkey has been going through a tremendous political and economical transformation process and ha the economy has achieved major achievements. When the AK party came into power in 2002 just after a severe financial crisis, the economy, as I said, was in shattered pieces, but the structural reform agenda that was put into place made Turkey become a favorable destination for FDI. <clears throat> Turkey's success was based mainly on four essentials. The first was a sound macroeconomic strategy, the second was prudent fiscal policies, and the third was major structural reforms, and the fourth was Turkey's EU accession process. All these integrated Turkey into the globalized world, increased the role of the private sector in the Turkish economy, and enhanced the efficiency and resiliency of the financial sector. <clears throat> now, when an investor plans to invest in a country, one of the benchmark they usually uh, need to know is how big is the economy. Okay, that is important, but we know that in the economical crisis, in global crisis, many big economies like the USA and European economies have suffered a lot. So another benchmark comes into place. It is uh, not how big the economy is, but how huge, uh, how, how, how is the growth rate of the GDP. And as you can see, in between 2002 and in 2012, the annual average uh, GDP growth in Turkey was 5%. <clears throat> Okay, everything has been going quite well since the last 10 years. But how about the future? Because we know that investors do not invest in the past, but they invest in the future. So OECD is projecting the annual GDP growth rate of Turkey as 5% to 5.2 uh, 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 between 2012 and 2007. And Turkey is expected uh, to be the fastest growing economy among the OECD countries. <clears throat> and uh, in the long run, again, uh, Goldman Sachs is uh, expecting Turkey to be the one, ninth largest economy in the world. So we have a good medium prospect as well as we have a, a good uh, longer prospect. But can we achieve this? Can we achieve? Because we can only speculate about future. And uh, when we look at the past uh, performance, Turkey has uh, tripled its GDP in just, in just six years. In just six years, from around uh, <coughs> 3,500 to over 10,000. And when we compare this to other countries, even US has uh, achieved this in 14 years, 
UK in 11 years, Germany in seven years, and even in Japan in seven years. <clears throat> As why the non Turkey is in the threshold of uh, being a member of the EU, but to be a full member, you have to uh, you have some criteria that you have to uh, make sure that you get them. According to master criteria, your general government debt stock should be less than 60% of your GDP. And we were able to catch these figures since 2004. And uh, with this achievement, we are better off than many uh, countries in the EU. And another master criteria, uh, as you can see here, <coughs> says that uh, your, uh, your budget deficit must be less than 3% of the GDP. We are around minus 2% at the present, and we are, again, better off than many other uh, European countries. Why Europe? Because a uh, majority of Turkey's uh, FDI and trade is with Europe. And uh, Turkey actually has a very young population, and we have half of our population is under the age of 30, whereas the average age in EU is uh, above 40. And young population is uh, never, uh, never a constraint on your budget. Uh, however, because the EU, the EU countries are getting older, uh, they have constraint in the budget for social security payments. That is why uh, the performance is uh, showing uh, ne negative. <clears throat> the performance of Turkish economy has also drawn the attention of credit rating agencies from the peak of 2009 global economic crisis and collapse of Lehman Brothers, Turkey is the only country in which all four rating agencies, Fitch, SMP, Moody's, and JCR, gave a country a rating upgrade. The Turkish government also did not have to bail out any of the country's banks during the global uh, crisis. This shows how resilient the Turkish economy is. You can see from this graphic that Turkey has a comparative advantage, which is the geographic uh, proximity. But you are not investors. I will not be talking about Turkey's competitive advantages to investors. But what I want to tell is that we base our strategies on our comparative advantages. <coughs> to utilize Turkey's uh, strategic location and opportunities that Turkey offers, Many global companies either establish manufacturing bases in Turkey or move their regional headquarters to Istanbul. Here you can see some of the major companies that, ha that actually manage their uh, regional bases from Istanbul. And we also know that, know that it is not the countries that compete in the international are arena, and it is the uh, comp uh, companies actually, not countries, but companies. So we have strong uh, national companies Turkish Airlines uh, is one of the uh, most successful airline company in the world. And actually, it flies from Istanbul to over 200 uh, destinations separately and directly. This, again, uh, shows how diversified uh, Turkey's social and economic ties are. <coughs> to understand Turkey's success, we should understand the structural reforms made in 2003 by launching the national treatment law, strengthening the investment climate. <clears throat> Legal amendments has been made for reducing administrative and bureaucratic barriers. With the new FDI law, uh, the major change is that we no more differentiate between a Turkish company and a foreign company. All of them are treated the same, and they have the same rights and liabilities. Not differentiating between uh, locals and foreigners is also not enough. You should also not differentiate between, for example, European countries with of Asian companies. All of the companies should be treated the same. This is the golden rule, actually. <laughs> and if you have a dispute in Turkey, uh, Turkish laws allow you to seek international arbitration. We have also decreased the corporate income tax from 20% from 33 So that was a major important step as well. <clears throat> And the government continues to try to improve Turkey's investment climate with the new structural reforms. For example, the new Turkish commercial law that has been effective since July 2012 is a good example to show Turkey's ongoing reform agenda. We know the Japanese uh, method of Kaizen, 
continuous improvement for better. That is actually the policy we adapt because we have it in our culture as well. Our today should be better than of our yesterday and our tomorrow should be better than of our today. So we should adapt this to our investment environment and there is always no end for uh, getting the investment environment to higher peaks. Another example to this uh, is the facilitation of real estate uh, acquisition by foreigners law, which was enacted uh, recently. So with this, we abandoned the reciprocity law. What is the reciprocity law? For example, if a Turkish citizen wants to buy a flat, a real estate, for example, in Kuwait, he cannot. So we say a Kuwaiti person cannot buy a land from Istanbul or a flat or real estate, but we abandoned this because this is nonsense when we compare the, uh, how large is Kuwait compared to Turkey in terms of area, it doesn't make sense. And when you look at your competitors, for example, United Kingdom, Switzerland, they do allow other citizens to buy land, uh, real estate property. So that was again a liberal movement in Turkey's investment environment. You have uh, two minutes. Okay. <laughs> all, all, all these efforts uh, show that uh, Turkey is on the right path and when you look at our global competitive, uh, competitiveness, it has uh, increased from 66, 66 to, we have moved forward to 43. And the competitiveness index does not only take economic indicators into account, it also takes social indicators. That means if you are moving in the global competitive index, your country is doing really something good. I'll pass this uh, incentive map. Uh, basically what we did in incentives, we divided the country into six parts. The least developed part of Turkey is the southeastern part. And if you invest in southeastern part of Turkey, you get the most benefits. Plus, if your incentives are strategic, what is strategic? If you are going to produce something that Turkey is importing, then you get the most incentives. Again, if you look at this graphic, Turkey attracted 123 billion of FDI in total during the last 10 years, whereas it has attracted 15 billion in the preceding decades. If there was no stability, could we have had this improvement? Obviously not. <coughs> and this again has uh, shown in the increasing confidence in the Turkish economy. Why? We have asked, uh, actually it is, <coughs> A.T. Kornu has done this uh, survey. Turkey has moved from 23 to 13, so 10 steps further when the global <coughs> CEOs and managers are saying that they feel confident, more confident in Turkey. And obviously, as an IPA, we do all we can to assist investors. We tell investors that instead of going one by one to other agencies, come to ISPAT and we will organize all your efforts from ISPAT. We will find you a suitable land. We will assist you with the incentive schemes. We will assist you with, uh, with the environment impact assessment report. We have an in-house research team which will produce professional reports for you. And all these are free of charge. And we directly report to our prime minister, which enables us uh, to be on top of Turkish bureaucracy and gives us strength. And we have uh, representatives all around the world 18 representatives and 13 countries, and those are local representatives. They speak the language of that nation, so it comes in very handy. <coughs> and uh, we have strategic uh, stakeholders. For example, I just want to give one example of our promotion activities and leave it. For example, you know the Fortune 500 co country, fo companies in the world. They are the largest multinational companies. We have spotted Turkish high-ranking officials in this Fortune 500 uh, countries, and we are in touch with them, and we give them information about Turkey's changing phase, Tur Turkey's improving investment environment, and we tell them when you consider investing in a country in every region, make sure that you consider Turkey with these last figures as well, so that has produced very effective. We have lots of promotion and image building activities, which I will not go into detail, direct uh, marketing events, we accompany our prime minister and president to wherever they go abroad, and we come to know lots of global managers there. And we have the Coordination Council for the Improvement of the Investment Environment. This is actually a platform where civil authorities meet with private authorities. So state coming together with the companies, with private and NGOs, 
and we look at the obstacles in the legislation and how we can further improve the investment environment. And you can see how Turkey has from six days, uh, number, number of days to set up, I mean six days ha has come to six days from 38 days. So every indicator shows that Turkey is on the right path. And we have another uh, platform where our prime minister comes together every, every year with the top 20 global uh, companies operating in Turkey. And they again talk and try to find obstacles and help. And all these have shown that we are on the right path as an IPA. The World Bank has assessed us as the 15th best IPA in 2009 out of 181 agencies. And last year they ranked us as the 13th. So we moved two steps forward again and we are the best 13th agency out of the 181 agency. And this comes to the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Rumeli. Now, when we look at Turkey and Greece, there is a number of um, uh, similarities. Uh, number one, Egypt and Turkey is very close in terms of population. And also in terms of location, as Mr. Rumeli has put, the same graph, uh, the, the, many uh, IPAs do that kind of uh, charts. Uh, the number of population that you can reach within two hours, four hours flight, etc. But Turkey and Greece is so similar to each other in terms of location that you could use the same chart for, for Egypt as well. So then the question uh, becomes the following. If Turkey has multiplied by 20 times the FDI intake uh, after 2001, after the crisis, as Mustafa Bey has said, over the last 10 years or so before 2001, Turkey used to uh, receive about $1 billion per year in FDI. But just after 2001, when the new government came and the stability uh, returned to Turkey, the average FDI intake before the, of course, global crisis reached as much as 19 to $20 billion. So then it could be an interesting example that Egypt could use maybe Turkey's experience and lessons in how to multiply the intake because these two countries are so similar to each other in many respects and actually Egypt has more advantage than Turkey, competitive advantage than Turkey when it comes for example to labor costs. Uh, I don't want to compare the two in terms of doing business because both of them are not doing very well anyway. But Turkey is climbing up, I really don't know what uh, Egypt is doing nowadays. But if those lower employment costs are coupled with maybe doing business uh, advantages, Egypt uh, could really jump uh, a lot in terms of uh, receiving uh, FDI. And from that perspective, maybe Turkey and Egypt uh, could use its, uh, you know, both others' experience. Now, before I, uh, I go to the other part of the world, which is Malaysia, I have a request, and I think I will entertain that request. Mr. Ahmed Harimi, uh, who is the regional manager of IDB in North Africa, will make a very, very brief two-minute intervention about what IDB means as reverse linkages. And I think it's very uh, important and very appropriate at this time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yuluk, and I really appreciate your kind uh, approval for that. And I'm very sorry for the other um, speakers, but just I have to rush you know, for an appointment at 4 o'clock. As the moderator mentioned, uh, IDB's uh, reverse linkage is one of the mechanism where we replicate the experiences from one country to another. And uh, this session is only 15 minutes. So no matter how much information the speakers provide, it cannot be really absorbed and comprehended within a short period of time. So if I may suggest to GAFI or to the Ministry of Investment that we can help and organize further extensive workshops or training of professionals that can be sent to these countries so that they can really go in details and go in depth of their really success uh, stories and we can uh, also play a greater role in uh, you know taking that even further by establishing other entities or uh, whatever you know institutional requirements in in this field so thank you very much and we are at your service thank you um, again, this reverse linkage idea whereby IDB member countries could learn from each other, 
So it's not only north-north or south-south, but member-to-member -member kind of cooperation. I think it's a very relevant idea, and uh, maybe Gafi can take this into consideration to work with IDB to further this, uh, let's say, experience sharing module. So now I have uh, Mr. Zulkefli to give us uh, uh, experience from Malaysia. Malaysia is also a very successful country in attracting investment as well as providing investment to external countries. So it's an interesting experience uh, whereby, again, they are giving and also receiving uh, capital from other parts of the world. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Murad. Uh, Colleagues, my colleagues are panelists from uh, ISPAD and also uh, ICD. Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, good afternoon. Firstly, uh, I would like to take this, uh, this opportunity to thank you uh, to IDB for inviting Maida to this forum uh, to share our experience in uh, promoting investment. Uh, allow me to brief uh, about Maida uh, before we proceed with the uh, Malaysian uh, investment performance and also policies and incentive. Uh, Malaysian, Industrial, Malaysian Investment Development Authority, or in short, we call it MAIDA, is a principal Malaysian government agency. Uh, responsible for the promotion of uh, investment in the country. It was established in 1967. Uh, MIDA is a first point of contact, or in other words, uh, windows for the investor who intend to set up a project, manufacturing project, plus also a services sector in Malaysia. Uh, before 2000, uh, 2004, uh, Malaysia is only focusing on the manufacturing sector. But after 2004, government has realized that the services sector is very important for the economic development. So MAIDA has given a task to promote services sector. Uh, MAIDA is an agency under the METI, uh, where you can see that uh, Halal Development Corporation is an agency to promote uh, halal industry. Uh, Matrix is uh, to promote uh, trade for the country and also MPC, Malaysian Productive Centre, uh, to agency responsible to increase the productivity for the country. Four co-function co of MAIDA, uh, promotion, uh, evaluation, planning and follow-up and monitoring the function. Uh, MAIDA promotes foreign direct investment through uh, trade and investment mission uh, abroad. Uh, we also focusing on the special project mission where we organize uh, based on the targeted sector and also targeted industry. Uh, and also we promote domestic investment through organizing a seminar and locally. Then uh, the government also encourage uh, implementation of project through the joint venture basis where the, we introduce uh, e-connect uh, where the foreigners can register online, uh, then they can choose a local partner. So we promote also manufacturing and also services. Then on evaluation, after we promote, then uh, we have to process for application for the manufacturing license, tax incentive, where I'll elaborate later. And then application for expert post. Expert post is allowed for this uh, short period where we don't have expertise uh, for the for, uh, multinational company to implement the project. Uh, we evaluate also, evaluate also the duty exemption, uh, where it is a part of the incentive that are provided by the government. And then uh, also as a regional establishment, it's like uh, operational headquarters, regional discipline center, international procurement center, and also RD centers. On planning, uh, we have recommended a few uh, policy and strategies uh, to ensure that the development of the industry in the country uh, will succeed. And then uh, the last part is uh, we do a follow-up to ensure that, that the project we approve uh, will be impl implemented according to the what uh, investor required and also the company to comply with all the conditions imposed uh, by the government. Uh, in, uh, in 1988, MADA has taken an initiative to set up one stock center. Uh, we, we have been informed that uh, Egypt wants to set up a one-stop shop. Uh, 
so this uh, more or less is the same concept where uh, few important uh, agencies related with the investment uh, has been uh, stationed in Maida, uh, such as Immigration Depa Depa uh, Department, where you can uh, deal with the uh, expatriate. Uh, royal custom, this is for application for the, any importation of raw material and it's also machineries. Uh, and then utility provider, such as telecom, and then also uh, labor department. This, this relates with their manpower. So f this, all the agencies is, will be stationed in MEDA uh, full time. So any uh, inquiries or any uh, application it goes through uh, Maida because this officer uh, is stationed in Maida and we can make immediate uh, approval uh, on behalf of the uh, department. And uh, <coughs> beside the uh, uh, agencies which is stationed in Maida, we have also a contact point of the uh, officer for every department which related with the uh, investment. Uh, in order for us to do uh, effective uh, promotion, we have a uh, 24 overseas center, and uh, for uh, Middle East and Africa, we had office in uh, Dubai and also Johannesburg. Uh, we go straight to the uh, <coughs> Malaysian economy uh, based on the real GDP uh, in 2012. Our growth is at 5.6%, uh, and it forecasted for 5 to 6% for 2013. Uh, GNI per capita income is a, uh, for 2013 is forecasted to be at 10,700 uh, ringgit. GDP by uh, sector, you can see that the uh, manufacturing sector is contributing about 24.9% where the service sector is 54.5%. You can see for the uh, year two, uh, 1970, the agri agriculture sector is uh, contributing about 33.6%, but uh, since 1990, manufacturing sector has overtaken uh, agriculture for the contrib more contribution to the GDP. Uh, on average, uh, overall, the GDP, GDP for Malaysia is 5.6%. Uh, then you can see that the uh, annual change for the manufacturing sector is 4.8% 4. 4. for 2012, and also services 6.4%, whereas agriculture is only 0.8%. Uh, the transformation program, <coughs> which is uh, the government has gone through uh, since independent 1957, you can see that there is a lot of... Uh, uh, changes uh, because in 1957 and 1960s, uh, Malaysian economy is, is more reliant on agriculture and mining sector. Then at the time, is uh, the poverty rate and also employment is uh, is very high, where the unemployment rate is uh, at the time is uh, more than eight percent. Then the price of commodity is uh, fluctuate. So the strategies at the time is uh, we promote import substitution industries where certain sectors, such as food, beverages, tobacco industries, printing and publishing, chemical and plastic industries, consumer product, is uh, encouraged by the government. Then uh, uh, for that period also, government has uh, introduced uh, tax incentive to promote for that sector. Uh, government also uh, has developed specific uh, industrial area where uh, more than 50 uh, industrial area has been developed at that time, just to facilitate for the uh, specific sector, uh, specific sector. And then in uh, 1970s, you can see that development issue is a uh, uh, un unemployment rate still high. Uh, development of industries constrained by small and uh, domestic market because we have a limited uh, population. My our population at that time is was uh, about 18 uh, 18 million. Then we had lack of uh, domestic capital. Uh, export manufactured product, products uh, because we are more on a primary products is very limited. Then we have lack of uh, managerial expertise, <coughs> lack of technology, and even distribution of wealth. Where uh, you can see that because Malaysian is a is a multiracial ethnic, 
uh, where the Chinese is uh, controlling uh, the wealth, uh, but the Indian is a uh, is a, uh, is a category, can categorize as a poor. <coughs> so the strategy of the government at the time is uh, introducing the nation we call it na new economic policy, uh, which the objective is uh, for for the poverty eradication and also restructuring of so society. The government has uh, taken an effort to promote industrial development. <coughs> Uh, then emphasize on job creation, where the project for the intensive uh, labor intensive uh, at the time is uh, promoted by the government. More incentive are uh, given to the companies if they are creating more jobs. So government also has uh, <coughs> taken an effort to uh, increase a foreign direct investment through attractive tax incentive, uh, where we introduced uh, in 1968. Uh, and also establish on a free trade zone and f uh, licensed manufacturing warehouse in 1970s. And uh, Industrial Coordination Act, where the industrial development is uh, uh, coordinated by uh, MIDA, was established in 1975, where the 100% foreign equity companies, uh, foreign equity ownership is allowed for the project if they are exporting more than 80%. Then by late uh, 1980s, the development issue are still uh, we are having, uh, facing a global re recession in 1985 and 1986, uh, where at the time it's unemployment is very high, uh, it's more than uh, 11 percent, and then we have a narrow manufacturing base in 1980s. So the strategy at the time is uh, uh, we have a wide and deeper industry base where the export and resource-based industries are promoted. Development of selective heavy industry, such as a motor vehicle, steel and cement, are promoted. In, in, uh, in this period, uh, the government has launched uh, our national car in uh, 1984, and also HICOM is uh, the agency responsible for the promoting of steel and industry. Uh, for the period uh, 1986 to 95, governments launched, uh, we call it first industrial master plan, where there's a blueprint for the government uh, to promote investment in the country. And then uh, we liberalized the equity policy where before 2003, uh, all the projects we allow uh, to be owned by foreigners subject to the, the company will be exporting at least 80%. But uh, in the 1980s, uh, 1990s, uh, for the, uh, we have liberalized the equity policy where the for foreigners can own the equity, uh, doesn't mean uh, they can export the product. You have three minutes. Pardon? Three minutes. Okay. So in uh, 1990s, uh, the government strategy is also still a promotion of uh, high tax industries, capital, skill intensive. Uh, then on 2000 and onwards, because we have a problem in the uh, services sec uh, sec sector, then we are focusing more on the service sector to ensure that uh, we have achieved our target to become a, a national country. And on the incentive, uh, uh, I go straight to the incentive that provided by uh, uh, basically our incentive uh, is covers uh, all the sectors: uh, uh, manufacturing, agriculture, and also services. You can see that uh, <coughs> the foreign, for, foreigners can own hard, uh, on the on the equity uh, policy. Foreigners can own one hundred percent foreign equity uh, without uh, exporting uh, market and uh, no rep rep restriction on the reputation of fund and also uh, profit. So that means uh, foreigners can uh, bring all the profits and so the to the uh, their home country. Basically, four uh, type of incentive uh, offered by the Malaysian government: pioneer status, investment tax allowance, reinvestment allowance, and import, import duty. So, as for the pioneer status, company can enjoy uh, for five or ten years, subject to the tax ex exemption, seventy percent or hundred percent of statutory income, and that means a company can only pay about thirty percent of statutory income. 
the exemption period is commencing from the date uh, we will uh, commercialize of the products. Then unabsorbed capital allowance can be carried forward. Uh, the eligibility of the incentive is uh, prom the company has to produce uh, promoted products depending on the level of technology and also industrial linkage. As for the investment tax allowance, uh, it's an alternative this is because the incentives given is a, is a mutual exclusive. One of these companies has granted uh, finances, they cannot apply for the investment tax allowance. Uh, allowance only 60% or 100% uh, on each quality capital expenditure incurred within five years. Uh, the company can offset uh, allow, uh, allowance granted against 70% of such income. Then as for the import duty and sales tax, this uh, incentive is granted for the companies uh, importing of raw material and also importing of machinery. Uh, uh, the eligibility is a basic use in the product process and not available locally. Uh, I want to mention here that uh, based on the incentive offered by the government, is uh, depending on the location. Uh, uh, if, you, if the government is a uh, emphasize to promote a less developed area, such as uh, in Malaysia, in, in this context, uh, uh, East Coast is a less developed area. So government has granted more incentive in terms of a uh, percentage to the companies where if they are intention to locate uh, the project in the Eastern Corridor. But as for the projects uh, located in the developed area, the tax treatment is, uh, will be less compared to the less developed area. So uh, as, uh, at the moment, I think uh, I'll stop it here. Then uh, we will, uh, I will reply on the bills on the Q&A. Thank you. OK. <laughs> OK, thank you, Mr. Zulkefli, for sharing the experience of Malaysia with us. Let me, um, we'll, we'll discuss maybe some of the issues during the Q&A. But let me now go to the next speaker, which is uh, Dr. Uh, Ahmed from uh, ICD. ICD is going to share with us, as we discussed earlier, its experience in the region and its experience with some of the investment tools that was instrumental in attracting uh, investment uh, by funds that are mobilized by ICD in addition to ICD's own funds. So uh, I think it will be a very now timely uh, experience for us to share as an international uh, dimension. Sure. Um, thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. I know it's very challenging to be the last uh, speaker in the last session just before the lunch. So uh, I think Gafi can uh, have already agreed with me to postpone or to elongate the session as much as possible to delay the lunch even further. If, uh, no worries about this. Um, the presentation, please. Yeah. Um, first of all, I think during the day you've had an idea about the Islamic Development Bank Group. I come from the private sector arm of the group, uh, ICD. And uh, between the, the, the entities of the group, we provide the trade finance, the corporate and investment uh, in, uh, investments and corporate finance, as well as the insurance and export credits that the uh, the first session or the second session have uh, have uh, talked about, but let me go straight to something that is very um, uh, related and, and uh, related to Egypt, the re regulatory framework of the country. During the day and during the sessions, there has been many talks about that the legal and legislative framework of Egypt needs uh, improvement. There's lots of duplications. Uh, believe me, this is uh, an exercise that took I think two three days of trying to put all the names of laws and regulations that are have some relationship with business from Gafi in one slide. So if you cannot see the, the, the black uh, ink, then the, you're perfectly fine. This is how, how complex the regulatory environment looks like. Egypt has, met, has some attributes in this case. There is lots of, of, of renewed and uh, developed laws. However, there's also some laws that have some bearing on business that dates back from the 30s and the 40s. So this creates some sort of complexity when some investors are talking about tax issues, about labor issues, and so on. If you look, there, we have a couple of uh, investment regimes. I'm not going to go into them by detail, but just to give you an idea. A couple of investment regimes, and we have some uh, general banking and financial laws. Some of them deal, for example, with issues like mortgage, which some uh, b bankers and access to finance would care about. 
as well as you have the business laws which touch everything from tax to, uh, to labor to land, um, um, competition to property rights and so on. And also you have sector specific regulations, We're talking from pharmaceuticals to uh, uh, petrochemicals and so on. Um, this definitely is only the tip of the iceberg. Uh, actually, there's two other elements that are missing here. One is that other than the laws, you have the decrees. I've heard that there is about 30,000 presidential, uh, prime ministerial, and ministerial decrees that have the power of laws that are in totality govern business. And this gives some of the administrative burden and some of the complexities that some of the investors look like. And some of the initiatives that have been taken by the Egyptian government, including Gafi, and I will come to it in the next slide, was actually to put all of these into one uh, basket and trying to look at these decrees and see whether they still make sense or not. So I'll, I'll just mention a couple of um, highlights on the regulatory reform, and then I'll move to ICD's uh, activities. Uh, a report by uh, MENA OECD uh, assessing the regulatory framework um, in relation to business in, in Egypt has mentioned a couple of key issues. The ones I've just mentioned, the, the, complexity legal, the complex legal system, as well as the uh, decrees. I forgot the third element, which is perception. Sometimes you will have uh, something that's mentioned in a, in, a, in a law or a decree. However, if you're trying to enforce it with a, with a regulator, the regulator would not accept it. It's, it's the perception and, uh, of the regulator, and this is how business should be done. For example, you would not be able to have, uh, if you are incorporating uh, um, an, a new entity in Egypt and you have your own corporate governance framework that you want to do, you would not be able to tailor your corporate governance framework. You cannot be able to do a couple of uh, transfer of shares or uh, independent directors. You, your article of association are defined by the law and there is some uh, adjustment that you can do, but you cannot uh, have, uh, be more creative in doing that. This is not mentioned in a law or a decree, but it's a practice of, of the regulator, which is also something that uh, you have uh, to bear in mind. So some of the ideas that was mentioned, that you have to have some sort of a commission to look at all the regulations, decrees, and start um, a process of cleanup, if you will, some reform, some if improvement, as well as introduction of some key legislation which are currently missing. Some of them in the key areas, for example, of uh, collaterals, movable and immovable, which actually can impact access to finance, can, act, uh, can impact the SME financing area. Um, also, uh, land laws, labor laws. Labor laws are scattered across a couple of laws, whether they are labor or the, they relate to the uh, incentives and guarantees laws, and tax, sol tax laws, as well as some things like insolvency and reorganization. For example, you do not have this kind of, kind of legislation here, and also this Similar efforts is being done in similar areas, for example, in the Kingdom of Jordan. Um, some of the key uh, dimensions that, uh, that, uh, that were supposed to, uh, to be done actually have been, some initiatives have been taken by the government and by Gafi. Um, in, the, in, the, in the previous couple of years, for example, in 2007, there was an initiative by the USAID and, uh, and the government to have some sort of a commission to do exactly this. But this was not concluded, and there was another uh, attempt by the Ministry of Justice, I think, in 2009, 2010. And then the most recent, I think, uh, uh, the deputy head of Gafi mentioned it to, uh, to it this morning was, was Irada. Irada was supposed to be a sub-cabinet committee from across uh, governmental ministries in order to look and to do exactly this, uh, a major housekeeping and a major... Uh, um, battery building of all the laws and uh, applicable to business in order, as a first step, in order to be able to, to talk about re regulatory reform. And this actually one of the things that they have mentioned is that the legislative process as, as, as currently practiced is actually very fragmented. You do not have a certain legislative agenda that the government or the ministry uh, does in a coherent way. What you have is different ministries uh, using their uh, legal and, uh, and legislative experts trying to promote their own agenda in terms of the issues that they face day to day. This is definitely more relevant. However, it creates some sort of miscoordination between all of these efforts. Um, not to go into more details, I'll jump into what uh, ICD has done uh, in Egypt. One of the areas uh, that we have touched upon was the need to generate uh, jobs. And also a key area, for example, for Egypt is uh, food security and agribusiness. So over the, over the past uh, one year, we've had uh, our involvement um, in the agribusiness sector, especially in the sugar uh, production and refining. 
uh, whereby if you look at uh, this, we find that in across MENA region, MENA region is a net importer of around 6 million uh, tons of sugar per annum, out of which Egypt is, uh, is a net importer of 1 million tons uh, every year. And sugar has been uh, ranked one of the top 20 commodities that Egypt has been uh, importing consistently for the past couple of years. And hence, there was here uh, a sense of urgency in doing something in that sector, uh, especially that you look th that the sugar currently uh, being produced, uh, part of it is actually sugar coming from sugar cane, which is heavy on water resources, and so uh, triggers so many other issues. F basically, this shows the agricultural uh, uh, map of Egypt. I'm not going to dwell on it. However, um, Sharqiya and the uh, sugar beet as a crop was one of the most prominent uh, crops and, 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 uh, and cities that are active in this, in this area. Um, this shows, for example, when we looked at the beet and the sugar industry, beet versus sugar cane, we found that there is very um, a success story that can be done by promoting uh, sugar beet agriculture. You can use it for reclaimed land instead of using it for the most fertile lands in, in southern Egypt, as well as you can uh, link it to an agribusiness or an agro-industry, which is in a case of uh, production of sugar from, uh, from beet, and hence this can enhance the returns of any investor who's going into an agriculture who would otherwise not do a pure agriculture uh, production uh, project. Um, this also has, has shown that in, in the past uh, couple of years there has been added capacities in this area and every time there has been a new pro a project go going into the, uh, the sugar production from beet there has been an automatic response in terms of farmers in how many uh, fedans or how many hectares have been uh, planted. And this shows that, uh, that a couple of strategic sectors, uh, for example, uh, yeah, being an Egyptian myself, I know about cotton, and we know also about sugar, that they are strategic and they are cash crops, farmers, and they develop uh, significant uh, economic benefits to farmers. F uh, the overall idea was that to have an integrated facility that does both uh, large-scale agriculture of beet as well as production of sugar uh, from beet, and then the the story came from the integration with uh, our sister uh, development uh, entities, uh, namely the Arab Fund for Economic and Social Development in Kuwait, as well as the OPEC Fund for International Development in Vienna. Um, we basically participated in two tranches. We participated in the, partly in the equity and partly in creating a, su um, a subordinated financing, uh, a financing which is less senior can create some incentives for both equity investors as well as for banks to do the deal because this project has been in the, in the making for, uh, for some time. Um, and a couple of key, uh, key issues that can be pointed out is that Egypt was not lacking uh, major liquidity. The, uh, the FDI share in this project is about a total $80 million out of 370. The Egyptian banks have closed the $220 million facility. This is during uh, the past two months. We're currently doing the documentation in the current uh, market conditions that everyone has, uh, as you witnessed in the previous session, was saying it's difficult and it's challenging. So local banks do not uh, uh, lack the, the skills or the liquidity to finance these projects, but, pro but, but probably you need some sort of a catalyst that can make, make these things happen. Um, for, the, for, for the information, we have a private sector uh, sponsor who is the lead, who is doing this, specializing in sugar, as well as a, a public sector or a state-owned enterprise, which is the Egyptian Sugar for Integrated and uh, Integrated Industries Company, as well as two multilaterals, uh, the ICD and the Arab Fund in the equity, and also we're providing the sub, uh, subordinate financing. The key banks, local banks, uh, giving the senior debt, both in Egyptian uh, pounds as well as in, uh, in USD, are the Bank Masr, uh, Bank Audi, and the uh, National Bank of Development, uh, the arm of uh, Adib, or the Abu Zabi uh, uh, Islamic Bank. Um, just key highlights, the project we're talking about, 372 million. Um, the key sponsors I've already, I've already mentioned. Uh, the construction period goes around, uh, around two years. And the, the land has already been, has already been acquired and, um, and registered. And uh, the, the, um, the point here is that this was not a government land, it was not a concession. It was obtained from private uh, investors. And this also linked to the issues that some of the investors were talking about earlier if the land was being obtained from a government, uh, government owner. You um, have four, four minutes, Ahmed. That's fine. Yeah. 
Um, on the good side, uh, the implementation of uh, highly mechanized uh, um, agricultural uh, methods as well as advanced seeds have allowed uh, the company, the agricultural arm of the company, to come from uh, an average beet uh, uh, productivity fadan in Egypt from 18 tons per fadan up to around 38 or 39 tons per fadan. And this is basically by using simple measures in terms of improving uh, mechanization, uh, uh, agricultural planning, as well as seed selection. Um, another component of the project is also to partner with farmers so that can small, small farmers and small farm holders will be able to contribute and uh, do their own projects uh, and their own production and improve their livelihood as well. Um, other initiatives that ICD is, is looking at, and we feel that they're going to be a catalyst in this point, is also um, in reflection to this approach that we're trying to use our own money in order to, ca to, to mobilize other resources from other uh, 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 multilateral institutions as well as private investors in key sectors, including renewable energy. We're currently launching uh, a Central Asia fund as well as and uh, in a couple of months will be a MENA fund in which uh, Egypt, Morocco would be and Jordan would be key countries uh, to invest. And, and looking at these areas, um, some of the key, uh, key issues that regulators can, can perhaps take care of, and I'm, I was actually pleasantly surprised to hear that uh, uh, the Ministry of Investment has took the ownership of the PPP unit from the Minister of Finance, as we were briefed this morning, um, is basically to uh, have a look at the feed-in tariff uh, legislation. You need to have a major uh, investment going forward in renewable energy, uh, the regulatory regime currently, uh, there has been a development. There was a, a, a law that was passed in 2010. However, it doesn't have the feed-in tariff as part of the legislation. Uh, another success story is that are not totally feed-in tariff are Turkey, where you have a mixed market-based uh, uh, feed-in tariff from private entities as well as um, a, regula a regulatory feed-in tariff to the government. So you have two options as an investor, and you can choose which one to go for. Uh, this definitely will be able uh, to push such key uh, investments forward. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the last two speakers uh, have talked basically about uh, number one incentives. The Malaysian speaker has uh, told us about what kind of incentives was in place that could attract uh, FDI and actually in the morning we have listened to the Minister of Investment who gave us an overview of uh, let's say the mega projects in Egypt which was quite exciting. So Malaysia uh, is also looking at uh, let's say corridors to develop through, uh, through let's say differentiating incentives and then uh, Dr. Ahmed from ICD has given us number one the regulatory, let's say, guillotine uh, warning, let's say, about Egypt, that there is too much of regulation everywhere that has to be basically cleaned up, right? And number two, then he gave us, uh, and let's say, international experience about how a DFI like ICD uh, has been instrumental in uh, financing, uh, uh, let's say, uh, an investment a, a, a physical investment in sugar beet manufacturing by mobilizing funds from financial investors or banks, let's say, uh, including uh, Bank Audi from Lebanon, etc., plus a strategic investor, I guess, from Saudi Arabia, right? Is that the strategic investor was? Yeah. Arab fund. No, no, not only OPEC fund and Arab fund, but you said also? Oh, okay, so it was an Egyptian company. Uh, let me now see how uh, the participants, how your appetite about intellectual discussion fares compared to appetite for nutritional demand. So let's see if there are comments or uh, questions. We will take them for a few minutes. And if not, then uh, I think we will go to the lunch and then the closing. So are you hungry about ideas or are you hungry about food? So the answer is here, that we are hungry about intellectual needs. Uh, Zainab Nawar, Ministry of Local Development. Uh, my question is addressed to Mr. Ismail. Yeah, it's about the incent 
actually you had talked about uh, two kind of policies in terms of dealing with the poverty. Giving more incentives to businessmen to work in the most poor areas, okay, this is the first thing. The second thing is about the policies that, that you had worked on certain policies, so you created more jobs for those who are, actually we have here in Egypt the, uh, the public works project, this project that is financed by the social fund and the, local, the Ministry of Local Development, we had worked in collaboration with the social fund in some things or some project called public works projects. Projects that mainly for the poor, creating jobs. So can we have just, you talk to us more about these kind of two experiences, giving more incentives to businessmen to work to the, in the, for, for the most poor areas and also for the public works projects or the projects that mainly creates more jobs and how to make this more efficient in creating jobs and raising the, uh, the income of the poor. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Eh? In the uh, 1970s and uh, 1980s, we have an abundance of our labor work, la uh, workforce. So, uh, and then the unemployment rate is very high. So because of that, then the government has introduced uh, there's a special scheme, special incentive for projects or for uh, foreigners who come to Malaysia to invest and then can create a job opportunities. Uh, for example, uh, at the time, we, uh, government has introduced uh, if the company uh, can uh, create at least 500 uh, job opportunities, so government has uh, offered special incentives to the, uh, to the company. Then uh, this, uh, this kind of incentive is only uh, for the certain period, because now is, uh, we have a shortage of uh, labor force, where in the country, in Malaysia now, is, uh, we have uh, 3 million of uh, foreign workers. We have to bring in uh, labor force from outside because we are having uh, difficulties in getting uh, labor force. So we are focus, focusing now on the uh, capital intensive project and then uh, also R&D and also high, uh, modernization of the project. So at the initial stage, yes, we have uh, do promote a labor intensive project, but for the certain period. Uh, it was mentioned by a minister also that uh, they want to create a uh, 121.2 million uh, job creation, and then uh, for that period, I think uh, Egypt can uh, adopt that kind of uh, uh, mechanism where for the foreigners, multinational company will intend to set up a project in uh, Egypt, special scheme can be uh, granted to the company. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question, question? or contribution? Okay, so I thank uh, the Egyptian government, GAFI, and Islamic Development Bank under the auspices of the uh, Deville uh, Partnership Program for organizing this session. And uh, I think now we are closing it. Thank you very much. Yes, um, gentlemen and women here, the third session has just concluded. Um, now it's lunchtime, so... Enjoy.